This is a conversation with Chris Williamson of the Modern Wisdom Podcast, who's interviewed a lot of the same people like Jordan Peterson, Daniel Schmachtenberger, and Mark Manson, and some we haven't, like Stefan Molyneux. Chris comes from a very different background. He was a club promoter in the north of England and a contestant on the first series of Love Island before starting up his podcast, which is mainly based around personal growth. We're releasing this as part of our State of Sensemaking series because it's a fascinating dive into the process and the ethics of truth-seeking and sense-making in the alternative media space. We talked about how there's so much emphasis online on the free speech censorship binary and a focus on the big tech platforms and not nearly enough on wrestling with the question of how can we find truth and what are the rights and responsibilities of people operating in the alternative outside the institutions. What I've really enjoyed about talking with Chris is that he's clearly taking these questions seriously and trying to act in an ethical way in an area where not everybody is. So I hope you enjoy the film. Chris, welcome. Thanks for having me. So we've been in touch quite a bit over the last few weeks, um, kind of informally talking through, having some really great conversations. I'm hoping we managed to kind of get close to it here, which is obviously going to doom us to not getting anywhere near. It's one of those ones where you wish you'd recorded the phone calls. Yeah, wish we recorded the phone calls. Um, and we've kind of touched on loads of different topics, mainly to do with the ethics of the alternative media space, problems of sense making. And it's been really interesting as well, kind of talking it through with you, because you've, um, you've got a really popular channel, Modern Wisdom. It's the Wisdom Crew today. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, and you've interviewed some of the same people. You've obviously come to it from a very different background to, to me. I come from kind of legacy media, BBC Channel 4, and I've got a sort of set of ideas, of protocols, of kind of ways of working that I'm still in a conversation around like how much are they appropriate to the alternative media space. Yeah, maybe let's start by you maybe talk about kind of how you came to this, because it's obviously a very different background to mine. Slightly, yeah. Love Island isn't the same as doing journalism. So I did, I was a club promoter for a long time. I still am. I run events and I've done reality TV, clout chasing, sort of young guy stuff, and then realized it wasn't really fulfilling me in the way that I wanted it to. I liked the money and I liked the status, but it wasn't, didn't sort of really hit me existentially. And I started a podcast to try and fill that void. And so far it seems to be working. Yeah. And I really like your you're very personable with your with your guests. You've got a really nice rapport with them, and I think that really comes across in the interviews that you're doing. I think my style, certainly up until recently, has been a lot more kind of question based, like more journalistic. Like my background was much more about okay, you have a set of questions and you're kind of trying to get a certain uh, uh, some information. And and I think my journey with this has been to bring a little bit more of myself into it because I think that's more appropriate for YouTube. I think I've brought more of a kind of old school media thing into it. Yeah, well, when you're used to being the center of the show, you have to actually take yourself out of it sometimes. So learning to ask questions, learning to pursue things, learning to be skeptical. You know, for a long time, my job and many other people's normal jobs is actually around being agreeable. You know, if you're the owner of a business, you actually really, really don't want that bad TripAdvisor review. So you do a lot of things. You try and find ways to sort of finagle the situation so that it's nice and calm and peaceful and make the other person happy. And then you get into the world where you need to be assessing very complex, deep, challenging topics with someone who is a specialist and you have just read the book. You've read a small portion of what they've done their entire life doing and you need to somehow be at a level of skepticism and rigor and precision that you can hold them to account. And it's a, a very steep learning curve. Yeah, and it's been really interesting in the conversations with you kind of reflecting on some of my assumptions for the first time because you've been like, oh, I haven't heard this before and we've kind of been exploring it together in a really interesting way. And it's basically the problem of truth-seeking. And the problem of truth-seeking outside the institutions is a completely new puzzle that I think a lot of us are kind of figuring out. And the one thing that I think people... Probably if you're not a content producer yourself, you don't kind of wrestle with them the same way as like so many of these come down to like individual moral decisions of the of the content creator. And like we we kind of wrestle with those behind the scenes. And 
and yeah, th there's so many different factors that we're kind of bringing into play, like the people that we're interviewing, how we're interviewing them, and my my kind of overall concern. I've talked about like the uncanny valley of truth seeking, which is the idea that we're the legacy is kind of gone. Like a lot of the a lot of the the, the legacy structures have gone, but we don't really have a workable alternative like we don't really like most most interviewers are not asking challenging questions because you're in a very different you're in a very very different dynamic like if you're working for the BBC or you're working for the New York Times you can be very challenging with someone they're going to say yes to the interview you've got a, the weight of an institution behind you if you do that as a as a young up up and coming podcast host you're going to find people stop returning your calls um, some of the challenging interviews I've done in the past, like with Dave Rubin, for example, have had consequences. Um, it's had consequences with, with other people in the ecosystem who were friends with Dave, for example, who I, I lost contact with, that kind of thing. So I've, been, I've had my own journey of kind of wrestling with, well, this particular person, I feel like there's some questions I really need to ask them. And I've, I've actually found that Americans are not so good at dealing with challenging questions. Brits are a little bit better. The, the interview I had with the trigonometry guys was probably the first one that was a real like spa that felt like we were still talking to each other after Amicable, the interview. Yeah. Amicable, and they were like, I think we've got a healthier culture in the UK of that sort of... Piss taking. Yeah, piss taking. And I think there's a longer tradition of it in our, in our journalism and in our politics, which can become performative. Like the, the, the Kathy Newman interview was the perfect example of like the Jeremy Paxman, I'm going to find out why these lying bastards are lying to me and put words in their mouth, kind of coming to its kind of natural conclusion. Like that, that was a very British. She was. She used to be a political reporter, and her like political reporters are all about trying to catch you out on their word, on your words, and and kind of just going after you in a very terrier-like fashion. And it, it becomes performative, and it's like, which is why I also use the word uncanny valley because it looks like truth seeking, but it's not. Like the uncanny, uncanny valley means it's something that looks almost human, but it's kind of, it's got that kind of weird like dislocation feeling. And I think a lot of our institutions have become facsimiles of truth seeking that look like they're trying to do truth seeking, but they're not. And it's like this weird kind of sick, almost kind of nauseating feeling when you interact with them. So it's got those kind of two different meanings. One of the interesting things that we brought up in our conversations is what you said there about playing the game, to what degree of game playing is it permissible? Because you could be the hard-nosed, skeptic, contrarian, pushing as hard as you want, but if your channel isn't sufficiently large to move under its own momentum anymore, you have neutered your ability. You can only do that within a certain number of circles so many times before people stop picking up the phone. And yet, there is a um, very passionate contrarian community on the internet that likes to see dunking. It's like dunk pornography. They're just there for the gotcha moment. They want the Dave Rubin Clips owned channel, right? That's what these people, look at what happened with Brendan Schaub's Fighter and the Kids subreddit. Like that is the most passionate subreddit I've ever seen. And it's people dunking on them. Like there isn't an equivalent community that's that bound together on the positive side of anything because the internet is so grift aware like their, their shill radar is on hypersensitive and it's very uncool to be positive, but it's very cool to dunk. But you, as a creator, have to make a decision. Okay, like if I want to get myself to a size of a channel where I can actually start asking hard questions and get access to the people that are really interesting, like I need to play this game a little bit. Yes, I don't want to compromise myself and completely roll over and let anybody do whatever they want to me on camera on my, on my show. But similarly, I can't push as hard as a Jeremy Paxman, you know, when you've got prime time. And then on top of that, another layer is that we're practicing in public. As creators, we are practicing on the stadium floor every single time that we do it. I do an interview with Jordan Peterson and I don't get to say, right, Jordan, I want to speak to you on Monday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we'll go for an hour and a half. Then I'll go away. We'll, we'll, we'll run the drills. Yeah, we'll practice how it's going to go. The dance routine can be, can be rehearsed. And then on the Tuesday, we'll actually, we'll go again. It's like, no, 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 this is happening live, riding the crest of now. You don't get to have a, a practice go at this. So the audience needs to be aware of the fact that 
a lot of creators are developing their skill set as they go, yeah, maybe they didn't say the thing that you wanted them to say. Maybe in retrospect, they didn't say the thing that they wanted to say. But you've got all manner of levels of complication here. What skill set does the particular interviewer have? What biases do they have coming in? What knowledge do they have about the particular conversation you're talking about? Are they actually quick enough and capable enough of seeing this? Sam Harris, in his most recent AMA, talks about the fact that there is a degree of uncertainty when you have a conversation live with someone which lends a sense of credibility to whatever the other person is saying. And typically, if you are the person with the show, you are a uh, good avatar for something close to the layperson, and you're trying to eke out of someone that's a specialist, they're gonna run rings around you in their specialist area. I mean, the work that you've done digging into COVID vaccines, ivermectin, that is very sophisticated. But the only reason you've been able to do that is because you've dedicated quite a lot of time to it and you've gone really, really deep in and you can't do that for every single thing that you're going to speak about. So although we need to have high standards, we want to hold people to account, we need to make sure that the content that's being produced is of the best quality, there are a lot of layers and filters and just saying bad faith or grifter or this person isn't acting in the way that they should, it's too simplistic of an argument. Which is the issue with doing this outside the institutions. And it was something I spoke to Eric Weinstein about quite recently. And it actually gave me a little bit of permission to give myself a bit of a break because I think I have, I have come in with a sort of set of assumptions um, to do with legacy media. And there are things that we've talked about and you're like, oh, I've never heard of anyone doing this before. Like, for example, right of reply. What's that for the people that don't know? Right of reply. Basically, the idea is that before you put out any piece of content, you put all of the, all of the claims or all of the salient points in that to the person that it's about. Say it's an investigation. You ask them to respond to all of these particular different points. So do they see the actual article in full or do you create some sort of shortened bulleted version? You put you you distill it down to a set of questions and then the idea is that you put their responses into the article. So you say, We found out this, they say this, and you get you get a kind of it's part of the article. And that right of response is right of reply, sorry, is something that's kind of really drilled into me and like recently, we'll be, I'm sure this interview will be coming out after all of the pieces of, about Brett Weinstein and the Dark Horse podcast and the ivermectin and, and all of the vaccine stuff. Talk to me about how people that aren't used to that responded when you gave them this. Because I presume that if you were from typical legacy media, mm. uh, an interviewee, you would say, OK, thanks for the right of response alert. I'll go through it and do my thing. What have the heterodox creators said to you when you've sent that over? It's been quite interesting because I don't think everyone is quite aware what right of reply is. Like I've sent the article over and I'm not sure people are kind of sure what to do with it. Like should I engage with it? And my point is like I want to hear before I publish it if there are any parts of it you think are unfair or that you want to respond to before I publish. So you're having to explain a little bit the purpose of the thing that you've just sent to a them. little bit because and this is this is a this is another kind of difference between legacy media and alternative media. And alternative media, the kind of assumption is you put out something, someone may put a put out their response video, you put out a response video, like Free that's threat. yeah, it's that's the that's the way that it goes. Whereas the the kind of the, the the legacy assumption is that you're putting out a single definitive piece. Say it goes into the New York Times or it goes into kind of any of the, any of the big media organizations, you want all of the the counterpoints to be in that piece you're not going to return to it. Like once you put that piece out, you're not going to return to it and have a kind of back and forth. So the idea is that there's that there are single definitive piece. And in a way with the alternative, we've now got to the point where it's not so much a definitive piece, it's maybe uh, um, you put out one piece, a provisional piece, and then a response, and then a response, and then you kind of maybe get into a back and forth. But um, for me, and also the, the whole idea of right of reply has has gone. Like I, I don't think anyone in the alternative landscape assumes that they should do that. That that's, well, that, that's part well, of the. I would, I would wager that most people don't even know that it exists. And on top of that, I actually think that the audience, some of the audience, a lot of the audience, is there for that back and forth. They want the dark horse Sam Harris, dark horse Sam Harris. They want that table tennis match mm. going on, because I think ultimately 
the, the ideas are interesting and, and people are genuinely bought into the ideas, but it humanizes it because there's a political soap opera drama element going on as well. And I think that's what draws people in. And then with audience capture, there's all sorts of slippery slopes that people can get down there where they think, well, it's not only am I sufficiently uh, indignant or uh, riled up or just feel like it's my right to reply to this, right of reply, I know that it's going to perform well yeah. because all eyes are on whatever this particular conversation is. Now, yourself and Brian Rose, or Coffee Zilla and Brian Rose, mm. you know, like uh, that causes eyes to come on you and it is so easy to get captured mm. and you have to have the skill set, you have to have the training, you have to have the education, you have to be able to see it in person mm. and all of these filters come through. Yeah. Um, here's, here's a question I had for you that I don't think I've asked you yet. Um, what duty do you think large platforms have to put on guests or topics that are pertinent to uh, the public's awareness at the time? Is it Joe Rogan's responsibility to have conversations about COVID if he doesn't want to? If he doesn't want to, that's so, a kind of loaded question. So he, he doesn't care? Well, I would argue, I mean, it's a question for Joe Rogan. And I, well, and, I mean, and I mean and if, if you look at what he has done, he has had people on about COVID once, once COVID became a thing. And I think there were quite sort of traditional medical figures uh, at the beginning of COVID. So I think, I think he probably does feel that sense of kind of public responsibility. And, and, I, and I think you probably do the, the, the impossibility. So I come from a background where there were broadcasting standards. Particularly in the UK, there's an Ofcom code which has got which has codified a lot of these kind of behaviours, and a lot of it is to do with accuracy. A lot of it is to do with kind of things like right of reply and not misrepresenting and all these sort of things. Um, what I think we've got in the alternative media landscape at the moment is that the bigger platforms are held to higher standards than the smaller platforms. Mm -hmm. You only like, and that seems really unsustainable. Like we all know that the tech platforms are very kind of haphazard in the way that they are enforcing their terms of service, but it certainly seems like someone like Joe Rogan is held to a much higher standard than someone further down the food chain. And so that, that's a kind of weird, whereas within the legacy media, everyone kind of knows the rules Off and the rules, and the rules pretty much apply to everyone, not necessarily Ofcom, there's also the code of conduct in, in press and, um, but yeah, every, everyone is, there's specific rules and everyone everyone learns the rules and that's part of kind of that's part of operating in the space whereas in the alternative space it really feels like you do what you can get away with depending on your size and you get a different set of expectations and accountability if you get to a certain level and i think joe rogan is clearly at that level where he's got a lot more eyes on him he's got a lot more scrutiny and i think he probably has a different set of there was a fantastic interview. So after he did the Jack Dorsey interview, when he had the Twitter boss on, and he admitted like it was a terrible interview, Jack Dorsey kind of pretty much stonewalled his questions and his whole audience turned on him. There was a fantastic conversation he had with Sam Harris after that interview where they talked through and Rogan was like, man, I got so much, like I knew it was a bad interview, but I didn't realize like my whole audience were like, you failed us, you've let us down because they expected that he would hold Jack Dorsey to account about kind of the way that Twitter has banned certain political views from Twitter and certain kind of, like if you talk about trans, it's hate speech and all this sort of stuff that, 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 that really applies to, to Rogan's audience. And Rogan, Rogan, you could see him wrestling in real time with, wow, I've got a whole new set of responsibilities here. Yeah. I didn't ask for this job, I just like, I just, I'm a guy who likes MMA and loves talking to people and, and billions of people listen to me. And taking day. DMT and suddenly I've got these set of responsibilities that I never asked for. But you also got the sense that he was wrestling with that in in kind of real time and in good faith and kind of accepting that responsibility to some degree. You saw it then he, he did he did the interview after that, he got Tim Pool on to kind of do a what little bit more of a yeah, you, you could argue whether um, Tim pulls the big guns or not, but it basically he sort of thought, I, okay, I need to get a someone with a bit more journalistic training yeah. on, and then someone Jack, that's just more disagreeable. Maybe just more disagreeable. Yeah, um, but he kind of went back and they had that conversation again. I think Jack Dorsey brought the Twitter lawyer with him. Yeah, they brought they, they all brought their own crews in, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, yeah. I, I don't know whether that was a good example, but you, but you did see Joe Rogan kind of wrestling with the fact that he got a whole set of audience expectations that he didn't ask for 
but was genuinely trying to kind of, yeah, to, to live up to. I think that's a good example because what you saw in real time was Joe becoming aware of, oh, hang on, not only are people listening to me, but they genuinely are invested in the outcome of the sense making that comes from this particular show. And if I don't do a sufficiently good job, then there are consequences to that. Um, what I'm interested in is whether or not you think that somebody of a particularly size, so what we do is we make decisions about what questions we're going to ask within an interview. One thing that everybody should be aware of, every podcast listener, is that if the interviewer was to quiz and drill down into every statement made by the guest, it would be a disgusting listen because you'd just fragment the conversation into so many branches that you'd never make movement down the actual central trunk. So you make an editorial decision with every question that you do make, and every time that the guest says something, you make an editorial decision to either, am I, is this something I want to pursue, or have I done that too many times, am I going to allow the, the conversation to continue? So there is an editorial decision that gets made there. But like the podcasting trolley problem is, is there a duty for a creator to have a conversation about something simply because they have a large audience. If that is something that, let's say that Rogan hadn't touched COVID or just he, large creator A hadn't touched COVID because they have a large audience, are they obliged to have that conversation? Because that's an editorial decision as well. Well, it's an editorial decision not to have the conversation as well. Correct. Are they, is there a responsibility to have a conversation about things that are large and going on in the world because you can access people? Hmm. I mean, there's certainly an implicit obligation to have conversations that people want to watch and want to listen to. And I would, I mean, I would argue, I mean, I come from a news background, so I'm coming from a whole set of expectations, like whatever is the most interesting thing and whatever is the most novel thing, then that's something that I want to cover. I want, I want to kind of make films that, that are about things that people are interested in. But I mean, that, that, there's a whole gamut of things. Like, how do you choose what people want? You could just limbically hijack and race to the bottom of the brainstem with that very easily. So it, it, should I be discussing the thing that's the hardest, that adds the most value? Who decides what the most value is? Mm. Like, these are questions. And the, the reason that I ask that is that I think when you talk about, if you want to ask the question, that creator should have said X or shouldn't have said Y, you also need to say, well, what guests are they bringing on? And if you want to ask what guests they're bringing on of creators of our size who don't have essentially ubiquitous access to any person on the planet, you need to say, well, what guests can they access? You can't bring someone on that you don't know. So let's say that you want to have a well-balanced debate between two different people and one of them's pro-vaccine and one of them's not. Well, what if your pro-vaccine contacts are significantly deeper than your anti-vaccine contacts? Okay, well... Is it your duty to somehow get a better, to, to develop your networks before you can do, have this conversation? Should you be at a particular level of insight or background reading before you can have a conversation with anybody about anything? Well, what if you're already at your limit? Does this mean that you can never touch on this topic mm -hmm. because you're really bad at stats? So you can't ever dig into the data about things or you don't really understand human nature or you're really bad at pop culture or politics or whatever. Mm -hmm. like, these are difficult questions. Yeah, and, and there are certain topics, certain people that you might have on that I would not have on because I wouldn't feel equipped to have that conversation, for example, especially if I thought they were um, in some way a bad faith actor or that I would know that I'd have to kind of ask them sort of serious questions about things that they've done in the past. And like, there are certain people I wouldn't want to have on for that reason. So I'm now jumping in to interrupt this part of the conversation with Chris, and I'm gonna to cut to the conversation we had after the interview. Because when I just said there were certain people I wouldn't have on, I was thinking specifically of Stefan Molyneux, who Chris did interview shortly after Molyneux was banned from YouTube last year. And this is where the conversation gets really meta, because I didn't ask Chris about his interview with Molyneux in our conversation in the studio, and after the interview, I felt strongly that I should have done. So we did a follow-up, and this conversation really reveals a lot about the exact issue of ethics that we were talking about in the studio. Chris, welcome back. Thanks for having me again. So we're going to cut this piece into the conversation we had last week. And why we're speaking again is really interesting, because 
in the aftermath of our conversation, I thought there's a question I wanted to ask Chris and I didn't. And it was about your interview with Stefan Molyneux. And before I knew you, before, before we kind of connected behind the scenes and we're talking, exchanging messages on, on WhatsApp and getting to know each other, there was a level of suspicion because I was aware of your interview with Stefan Molyneux. And I, I think if, if I hadn't already got to know you before the conversation we had, I would have asked you that. Like I would have said, um, what happened? What, why did you interview Stefan Molyneux? Like, um, and it's not, it's, and this is directly related to everything we were talking about. Like, what are the ethics of interviewing people? What are our responsibilities of knowing someone's background? And the reason that Molyneux in particular comes up is, and I might play a couple of clips here just so people know, like, what the backstory is of Molyneux. I I'd heavily recommend people to watch Timber on Toast's third part of the Dave Rubin series from about 30 minutes in. He covers Molyneux for about 40 minutes and it's an incredibly detailed piece of work. He goes back through court documents. He looks at kind of the whole backstory of his interview with Joe Rogan in 2008 and credits Rogan for doing an amazing job of holding Molyneux to account for some of the stuff that he's done. So it's not just that Molyneux is kind of he frames himself as a philosopher and, and, and mainly sort of just about ideas, but behind that is a clear kind of like he wants a white ethno state. Basically, it doesn't matter which of Stefan's videos you click on, you're gonna get some kind of dogmatic lecture about breeding and gene pools and the preservation of the white race. Towards the end of the race and IQ conversation, there's a notable change of pace where Stefan starts using some very poetic and flowery language, painting an apocalyptic vision of society tearing itself apart and destroying itself, and he vaguely hints at there being a solution to all of our problems that nobody wants to accept. I cannot understand how we're going to ignore things, how we could, we could solve anything by ignoring facts. Maybe there is a fix. Maybe there is something that can be done. I'm sure there is something that can be done. He never actually goes as far as to say what could be done. However, I would venture that anyone who's a regular viewer of Stefan's videos on YouTube would have a pretty good idea of what he's getting at here. I can't help but think, Jared, that if I lived in a society of white people, then the giant fly swatter of shut up whitey, you're racist could never be used against me. We could actually have debates about ideas rather than ethnicities. We could actually have debates where reason and argument could win. I think I can understand certain perspectives where people say, well, if we're so terrible as white people, we should really leave you all alone, right? We should just withdraw ourselves to our own areas and we should just separate. And that's a kind of hidden thing that comes out or doesn't come out depending on the interview. And behind that, he's had this organization called the Free Domain radio show for a good sort of 15, 20 years, which is basically a cult and where he advises people to break off contact with their family members, what he calls defooing and justifies that by saying, well, you didn't choose them and they're, a lot of them are bad people and that this is a good thing to do. What would you say is the thing that people uh, find most controversial about you? Is there one topic mm. that you consistently hit on that you think people either give you the most flack or you think is sort of wading into the most dangerous Gosh, if territory? I, if I knew that, Dave, I would hit on it more. You, you on, well, <laughs> I've, got a, I've, boom, got a couple, boom, boom. I've got a couple right here, but yeah. I thought I'd, I'd throw that to you I first. I think, I would say, I would say that the concept well, so, so there's some abstract ones and there's some personal ones. Yeah. And people tend to get most upset about the personal ones because that's where people have kind of like a stake in, in their life and in their world. So for me, for sure, I think people get most upset when I talk about, say, for instance, you don't have to have abusive people in your life. Now, you might be thinking, what's controversial about Stefan's position? And you're right. There's absolutely nothing controversial about what Stefan said here. His sentiment about cutting abusive people out of your life is something we read about all the time in liberal media. It's the bread and butter of millennial blogs. However, Stefan is merely hiding behind this universally approved sentiment to avoid having to discuss the real reason why this is a controversial subject for him. Stefan's had a philosophy podcast called Free Domain for as long as podcasts have existed, with a very avid fan base of listeners. In 2008, The Guardian published an article telling the story of Tom, a teenager who was a frequent listener to Stefan's show, who abruptly in the middle of his A-levels left home and never saw or spoke to his parents ever again. Stefan was asked about this in a BBC radio interview after the article was published. 
Are you telling me that you would never suggest to somebody like Tom that he should turn his back on his family? You would never suggest that he should do that? In the conversation I had with Tom, I simply reminded him that the relationship is optional. I said, you can stay, you can go, but it is a choice that you should make. No, 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 but I'm, ju I'm just asking you whether or not you ever suggested to Tom that he should go and turn his back on his family and cease all communication with them. Did you suggest no. that at all? No. You did not? No. We've got the audio of Stefan's conversation with Tom, so we can listen for ourselves and see how well it tallies up with Stefan's reasonable explanation. Let's have a listen to Stefan calmly giving Tom some impartial advice. This is the scenario that you know deep down, but it's not conscious probably yet. Your mother met your father when they were young. She knew that this guy had sick and disgusting rages before she married him, probably after the first date. And then she said, OK, I'm going to marry to this guy who's, got, who's a bully, who's got irrational rages, who's kind of psychotic, who's dangerous, who's violent, and this and that, right? And now what am I going to do? I'm going to give him children. This sick son of a bitch who's a bully, who's psychotic, who's insane, who's violent, who's terrifying, who's destructive, who screams at cats. I'm going to have sex with him. I'm going to carry his children. I'm going to have his children. And I'm going to give him the children. So it's not that she failed to protect you from the devil. She created you for the devil. She created you for this guy. She delivered you to him. If I sell my wife into slavery, is it that I failed to protect her? No! I sold her into fucking slavery! Does that make sense? It does. I don't feel sad now, I just feel completely angry. Right, that's good. Mothers create that, because mm. they choose these guys, and they breed with these guys, and they hand their children to these guys, and then they say, I was the victim here! Does this sound like the right way to speak to a vulnerable teenager? The College of Psychologists of Ontario, Canada would say no. A disciplinary panel from their organization ended up reprimanding Stefan Molyneux's wife, Christina Papadopoulos, because despite being a professional therapist, she joined Stefan on his podcast to have similar conversations to the one you just heard with his callers. In 2014, Joe Rogan had Stefan Molyneux on his show, and in the finest moment of his career, Rogan directly challenged Molyneux about the shady nature of his advice to callers on his podcast. But I think that when people hear that, this uh, idea of cutting people off, defooing as you call it, mm. cutting people off, it makes them nervous. Why? Because that's no, no, why? I mean, this, this is it's principal directive no, of cults. It's not. It's not. That's otherwise, not a principal no, directive no, of cults? No, because to cut otherwise... Out of your life? No, no. I guess I knew that backstory before and was sort of suspicious but I didn't ask you about the Molyneux interview and I think the conversations we've had since have kind of opened it out into like this is a really interesting case study about all the stuff we were talking about in the film um, so what about the Molyneux interview? <laughs> yes I mean it's a personal perfect example kind of 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 what we're talking about right uh, the reason that I invited Stefan on is because I woke up one morning to find that he was trending on Twitter and the reason was that he had had his YouTube channel deleted. I think this had occurred along with some others. I don't think it was just him. It didn't seem like an isolated incident. And I thought, well, like, this is newsworthy. This is a guy who's been on the platform for f like 15 years, basically since it started, nearly a million subscribers, uh, it's like tens of thousands of videos, perhaps, like some unbelievably huge library of videos. Uh, I, I'd watched some of his stuff a long time ago but wasn't like hugely familiar with what he'd done the stuff i was most familiar with that he'd done recently was a, a live debate with stephen woodford a guy called rationality rules um and i thought right well i mean this is newsworthy i've had carl benjamin on recently after he got sort of cancelled and i thought well this is an interesting conversation it's kind of timely you know youtube censorship and th this was not long after it was maybe it was before the Brian Rose stuff. But anyway, like, you know, it, that was an ongoing discussion among people. So I thought, right, this is, this is worthy of me bringing him on. Yeah, and I guess there's two things we should separate here because obviously there's such a sensitivity on YouTube to censorship. 
And we're, we're talking about two different things here. We're, talking, we're not talking about kind of the justification of whether YouTube was right to kick him off their platform, which we can talk about as a separate issue. We're really focused on the kind of ethics of responsible interviewing. Like what are the ethics in the alternative media space? Um, and, and, and my question of like, for, for example, I would never, I don't think I would ever interview Stefan Molyneux because the kind of stuff that he's talking about to do with race and IQ, I don't feel qualified to, to address. I think there are probably other people who may be more qualified to address that and I don't want to boost that. I find his interest in that quite sinister. He's clearly got an ob objective. He's clearly got um, an end point in mind that he is, that, that he's, like, he's welcome to have that, that view. Like, it's not about shutting him down, or so, but, but I would not want to boost that personally by getting him on my, my show. Um, I know from our conversations behind the scenes that you maybe weren't so aware of a lot of his, his background. And then that brings up the question of like, how is it possible to know everyone's whole backstory before, well, actually, I won't, I won't put words in your mouth. What, what was your awareness of him before, after, since? And how do you now view that, that, that interview? Yes, I mean, the first time I ever heard the word defooing is when you said it to me in a voice note yesterday. It's the first time that I've ever heard it. Uh, it wasn't until I started watching the Dave Rubin clips channel that I saw the clip of him going, yeah, different sizes when he's talking about black men and white men's brains. And you're like, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit much, isn't it? Like, wow. Like that, that, so that was, you think, wow, but what's the duty to know what you don't know? We are fallible humans, right? Like this is a perfect example of us learning out loud, of us practicing in public, the fact that I can't know what I don't know. I was having a conversation, as far as I was aware, around why is your channel being taken down? So it seems like there are certain individuals on the internet for whom they have such uh, reprehensible pasts that they shouldn't be permitted into a conversation without you challenging them on something, even if that's not the topic that they're there to talk about. Like if Charles Murray starts a new fitness website, and he's talking about his new training routine. It's like, okay, do you have a duty to bring up the bell curve? Or if Richard Spencer brings out a cookbook, you're like, okay, do you have a duty to bring up his past? I mean, both of these sound like quite interesting business ideas, actually. But um, I just think, at what point are you held accountable for having a conversation that you didn't have? I didn't know, like I say, I, I don't know what I don't know. And how culpable are you for not pushing somebody on something that you don't know about? Now, I fully agree that there is a requisite amount of research that has to be done. There is a, a responsibility as a creator to do your research uh, around the guest that you have that's coming on. But if you have a narrowly bounded topic, like why was your channel taken down from YouTube or here's your new fitness book or here's your new cookbook, um, uh, the, the channel being taken down from YouTube to steal man the other side, there is definitely an argument that that encompasses his entire body of work for the rest of time. So, but I mean, obviously you can't do that either. So... Yeah, it's it's challenging. And then since then, I mean, some of the stuff that you've sent me is is crazy. But I'm sure that in your past, you know, either on Rebel Wisdom or on in your previous life as a journalist, you have interviewed people and then after the fact realized something about them. Uh, this very situation that you are having with me right now, the fact, uh, super ironically, that we've had a conversation and after the fact you've realized that you regret not asking me a question that you wish you had, demonstrates the fact that this occurs in real time as we're having a conversation about it. Yeah, that's what I love about this, this topic, like why I think it's worth recording this extra bit and what I've really enjoyed about our dialogues around this is that you ask really, really good questions and you're clearly wrestling with it in good faith in real time in a way that I think makes me think about kind of what are the, what are the unconscious assumptions that I've made based on my background in, in, in journalism that are appropriate and what are not appropriate for the alternative space and how, and, and the, the question that we covered in our, our dialogue that we recorded in the studio was, how can we create some kind of ethical framework or how do we develop, how do we, how do we wrestle with these questions? Because like the, the Molyneux, let's say, let's say the Molyneux situation, but let's maybe take an example of someone, um, th there's actually, a great conversation between Eric Weinstein and Sam Harris about this in a town hall that they did that maybe I'll play a clip from where they're wrestling with this and Eric is saying, well, what happens if you, we need to learn to, to realize like not every 
reprehensible person, every, not everything out of their mouth is reprehensible. They've actually probably got some good points. At what point is someone beyond the pale? At what point may you kind of get someone on to your show and maybe even do a good job of challenging them, but other people in your audience find them inspiring, maybe go out and do something based on what they've seen. Like, we don't know this conversation. We, um, and I think Eric, Eric called it dining a la carte. We don't know how to do this. What you've pointed to is the fact that people who we think are beyond the pale, I'm assuming many of us think Milo is, is uh, for some reason, for various reasons, beyond the pale, can sound totally reasonable if given a chance, and that there's something wrong with so-called platforming them well, even when, the, even and, this, and letting them do that, right? So that term, I hate platform. Like, who speaks like yeah, that? I know, like, so I've just experienced this from the other side. Uh, so I was just on, on Kara Swisher's podcast, um, and I noticed she's getting immense pain for having platformed me, right? Like I'm her Milo Yiannopoulos, or, you know, and I was able to sound disconcertingly reasonable for her audience and yet her audience knows I'm the gateway drug to something horrific. Uh, and so they're blaming her for having even had a conversation with me. So this is the bad version of the problem, in my, in my estimation, um, where that is insane to me. But, and, but presumably there's a case where it is sane because if you put a genuine white supremacist or some, some other nutcase on your podcast or on your show, and fail to reveal what's wrong with them. You let them... No, but, but what if I put uh, a nutcase on the show and I do reveal what's wrong with him, but it's still, it, he's found inspiring uh, to somebody who wishes to commit acts of violence, right. right? So what are my responsibilities? We've never worked this out. We've never had a really good conversation about the fact that the Sam Harris platform and the Sam Harris human are very different than, than, let's say, the Michelle Goldberg human on the New York Times platform. And a lot of these t traditional commentators have lower engagement as individuals. And if you think about the fusion between the chair and the human, the chair has a lot of the power. Like any time the New York Times says that person there is worth listening to, that person, whether they have interesting ideas or not, or good or bad ideas, becomes super important because they inherit power from the chair. So now when that sort of set of responsibilities comes through to me, like I don't have a book, I don't have a show, I got mm -hmm. nothing. I just, I, I, my, my wife tells me, you know, I'm tired of your theories, go to Twitter and, and, and try it out with, you, with your audience. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's my platform. And, I, and then I hear things like, Eric, you have a platform, you have a tremendous responsibility. It's like, what platform? I just, I signed up for Twitter. And that, that kind of weird new problem is super interesting because... I've never really had to think about this. I built the entire thing completely 100% by myself. And there's all of these questions on the alternative media that we haven't resolved. But the interesting one that it brings through to me is the, the realization that there are, like what you get from being in a newsroom, for example. Like I was in the newsroom at Channel 4 News for many years. The knowledge and the awareness and the experience in something like a newsroom, there's probably hundreds of years of journalistic experience. Like when you've got a story that comes up around a certain topic, it's like, ah, oh, what about that person? What about that person? And there's going to be someone who says, no, no, that, check out, look, what that person's been doing or that person's backstory. Don't get that person on. And, and so you get the, 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 the bad side of that is that they probably draw the bounds quite narrowly. And there are some people that probably have like it, it's the mainstream legacy media. They, they draw, draw the bounds very narrowly and it's very easy to have kind of guilt by association and oh, that person's had um, Darren Grimes on their show, we're never gonna kind of let them on again or whatever. Like the trigonometry boys, I think, wrestle with this quite a lot. Um, so the bounds are drawn too narrowly, but at least, yeah, there is a level of, there is a level of awareness and, and experience and knowledge in something like a newsroom that's able to say, you know what, I'm not sure getting Stefan Molyneux on is a great idea unless you're gonna challenge about this whole deferring thing and, um, and also catch him in a lie, which is what Rogan did. Rogan actually caught him in a lie on his show. Um, and and Tim, Timber points that out really, really well. And it, it's, that's the other question. It's like at what point, because I think there's a different set of rules for good faith and bad faith actors, which is the problem that comes in and 
Tim Borontos' amazing set of films about Dave Rubin illustrate this. With good faith dialogue with good faith actors can work. When you've got bad faith actors who know how to sort of portray themselves in one way on a, on a particular show and another way to their core audience, someone like Tommy Robinson, for example, who makes a lot of good points. And actually, I think I, I even had colleagues at Channel 4 News who thought that he'd been given a hard time by the media. Um, but he's also been violent. He's also said to kind of push, push the boundaries in many different ways. And it's like, it, it's a very difficult thing when you've got people who know how to tailor their, their message. And then you probably do need to challenge them. You, you can't just do what Dave Rubin does, which is just get them on and agree the hell out of them and assume that that's going to kind of reveal truth and they'll, they'll eventually put the noose around their neck and hang themselves if you let them talk long enough. That's not the case. These are, these are trained media professionals who are used to doing what they're doing on your show and portraying themselves in a certain light. I mean, that's a, the, the fact that we are a moving target as well as the guest is. So for instance, the, the Molyneux interview for me was a really important strategic learning opportunity. Having had a lot of discussions with you, I've realized, okay, like my skepticism muscle isn't as hypertrophied as it needs to be. Like that's, that's sort of a, a skill that I need to acquire. And since then I've been working really hard at developing that ability. So yeah, the, the question around good faith and bad faith is the important one, I think, or it's one of the important ones because people are prepared to accept somebody missing a penalty if they believe that they were trying to hit the goal. But the internet defaults to grift or shill or sycophant so quickly that you don't really get that benefit of the doubt. And you said it yourself that you were suspicious of me in advance of meeting me and in advance of, you know, deeply having these conversations and really trying to get to the the synthesis of, it, am I trying to do this well? I genuinely care about doing this correctly. I really, really am bothered about trying to be the best version of an interviewer that I can. And that means that I'm going to make mistakes. Like I, I'm trying to be adept at having conversations, but I'm going to make mistakes. And that means that the audience needs to come along with you. And I understand like it's really, really difficult on the internet to work out, is this person being willfully ignorant? Are they a useful idiot? Are they being sort of purposefully malicious? You know, where where on this continuum do people sit? And I think the, the Molyneux interview was 180 something, and I'm now on 360 something. So you're talking about basically something you said when you were 18 versus something that you said when you were 36 proportionally. And yeah, it, over time, everyone's going to develop. And it's a, it's a really, it's a difficult environment to to move through because you're also considering well what does this mean for me long term like if i bring this person on charles murray's just brought out a new book like the the fallout of that interview with sam harris means that bringing charles murray on is essentially impossible for most people for most creators like i i don't know i haven't read the new book but maybe it's interesting but can i bring him on and talk about the new book without bringing up all of his other stuff well a lot of people on the internet would say no mm. Yeah, the, there's so many fascinating points here. I mean, one of which is, I don't know if we need to spell this out, like why, in my view, is giving Molyneux a platform a problem? In my view, it's because some people will watch that, some people will go and find his stuff, some people might be drawn into the, the defooing, the, the kind of the more kind of dodgy side of what he's up to. So I think that, that's where I feel the certain sort of personal ethical sense of responsibility of not... The only reason that you're able to have that ethical sense, though, is because you're aware of his backstory with the level of finitude that you do, right? At the level of finesse that you do. Sure. But I also say, like, one of the real paradoxes, and that this is completely unworkable as well, I think, is, is that the rules at the moment are this sort of sliding scale. And I think your channel is now at a point where it's getting noticed and... I think the decoding the gurus, for example, are doing something on your interview with Gad Sad that may be coming out um, today, I think, or or soon. Um, and I think this is the this is the case. Like, I'm pretty sure that we did things on Rebel Wisdom that we were able to get away with that we're not able to get away with now. Like, there's there's a kind of tipping point of of prominence, and that and this is the the ridiculous thing. Like, at least in the legacy media, there's a set of guidelines, Ofcom guidelines for broadcasters, for example, and they're actually fairly 
it's quite a short set of guidelines and they're very sort of, um, they're written in quite easy to understand language. I highly recommend people go and have a look at them so that they understand like, and I'd say they're pretty common sense. Like if you have to, to try and achieve balance, to try and achieve fairness, and you can argue how much the legacy media achieves that, and I, I'd agree with a lot of the criticisms, obviously made a lot of them on Rebel Wisdom. But the situation in the alternative media is that you are under scrutiny and a different set of rules depending on how big your platform is. So someone like Joe Rogan, someone like Sam Harris has a huge amount more scrutiny and, and is essentially having to play by different rules than someone else. Like I'm pretty sure that a podcast um, or a YouTube channel with under 100,000 subscribers could interview Charles Murray and get away with it. Like, well, I mean, there's not... an example there because even the channel size is a moving target. I think when I spoke to Stefan, I would have been on maybe 25,000 subs. When I spoke to Gad Saad, I would have been on maybe 50, 55,000 subs, and the channel is now on 220. So you can be judged, you can retrospectively be judged by the size of your channel now for the actions that you took on the come up toward where you're at. And you're like, well, all right, I mean, fair enough. If we want to always hold people to the highest standards possible, then cool, but it's just not realistic. The skill set, the understanding, the experience, this is what makes for a channel that's worthy of having 220,000 subs or whatever. Like, it's not many people's actions during their adolescence are immortalized on the internet to be scrutinized for the rest of time. But as a creator in this space, they are. Yeah, and what I like is, as I said, you're and I've experienced this ever since our kind of first interactions, like you're genuine wrestling with it and wanting to, to take on that responsibility. Because what I feel, um, it's fascinating because we're all on the tech platforms and they're very obviously biased towards America. I've got probably similar to you, probably maybe 40% of our audience are based in America. And they have a very different attitude, I think, towards like the First Amendment and their sort of, there's a, there's a sense of free speech absolutism that, and I'm going to say this and it's going to provoke a lot of stuff in the comments because I know this more than any other topic on YouTube, I think, provokes a reaction. I think free speech absolutism is an ideological position. I don't think, I know the arguments for it. The arguments are, oh, well, who gets to make these decisions anyway? If you give someone that power, then, and to, to be a censor or to be a, mo to be a moderator or a censor, they will be abused. And also the argument that, um, so the first argument is that it's a slippery slope, and the second argument is that um, good ideas, good speech pushes out bad ideas. Now, I think that is unproven at the very least in the modern media landscape where we've just got an infinity of different inputs, and some ideas are more sticky than others, and we've talked about kind of, um, like QAnon, for example, is an incredibly powerful narrative and pushes out alternative narratives for a lot of people. And I also... Like, honestly, I think it's an American thing to want free speech rights with no sense of responsibility. And to be honest, I think any, any rights without responsibilities is not freedom, it's adolescence. And from my position, or from our, well, certainly from my position in the UK, I think, I think it's adolescent. And I also think their experiment with rights without responsibilities in so many different areas of American society, where, whether it's on the sort of the woke left or on the kind of free speech right, I don't think it's going particularly well. Not a fantastic case study, I would agree, yes. It's not, it, like, guys, what, what are the ideologies, what are the ideas that you're holding that are getting you into the problems that you're experiencing now? Like unregulated, unregulated speech. And regulated speech doesn't have to mean censorship. It can mean... How do we create healthy ecosystems of challenge, accountability, and care, like in the same way as our ecosystems that we live in, rather than rather than like focusing on crime and punishment and putting away the bad people? How do we create positive feedback loops where people are proud of the place where they live and they put um, care into it and then hold each other accountable and support each other? Like, well, I mean, that's this, the, this that's the interesting question. Yeah, and it defaults to this sort of dunk porn that I think the internet loves. It's far easier and far more binding together for people to um, 
find an out group that they dislike than an in group that they do. And a lot of people bind together with an in group just simply because they're able to dunk on an out group. And this is where the sort of shill and grift radar comes in that because it's such an easy slur to throw at somebody and it's so difficult to wipe that slime off you, you know, as is um, being shown here by the fact that we've had to have, you know, a month and a half of conversations for your suspicion to start to abate around around me. And yeah, I, I, quite rightly, I think people should be skeptical of the, the creators that they see online. But also, if we want to have some sort of enforcement mechanism, if we want to have rules of procedures, practices, standard operating, uh, modus operandi of how people are going to move through things, like who's enforcing that? How does it get enforced? All of the questions that we brought up on your on your show before. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a complete mystery in a way like there has to be some kind of the, the example that I like to give and again people are going to probably spout off about this in the comments as well I'd give an example of the BBC like the BBC was a solution to a particular problem that came along in the 20s and that was this realization that radio and television were qualitatively different to the the media that we had before and it was a process that we went through in the UK to say, okay, we, we think these are, there's a level of coordination, a level of influence that are possible with these new technologies that we didn't have before. We think it is actually a, a step change away from, from print. And so the BBC was created deliberately as a sort of arm's length from government, as, as, a, as a process, it, it's, it, I don't know, people in America probably don't know, don't know this about the BBC, but... We can talk about how it is now, and I think it's under a different set of challenges and is failing more and more under those challenges, but the history of the BBC throughout sort of the, thir the 20s, 30s, during the Second World War was like, it it's an incredibly powerful brand and I think was hugely influential during the Cold War, hugely influential during the Second World War as a source of independent reality for a lot of people. Like, I think it really lived up to that, and it lived up to that because... It was set up in such a way, it's got arm's length from government, it's got a charter system that is renewed every 10 years. But I think the people who set it up realistically wanted it to be independent of government. Therefore, it's funded through a TV license that everyone has to pay. Like it's, it's a faulty system in so many ways. It's a crazy system in so many ways. But in many other ways, it's done incredible work over decades to hold government to account. There have been like, I think of Death on the Rock, where, where Panorama did this amazing expose of um, the killing of, of um, basically the killing of unarmed people by the security service. I think that was in the 80s. Like they've been, you, you can go back kind of all the way to the sort of 1940s, well, 1950s, certainly, and the work that it's done. But, and, and they were right to set it up because you look at then what happened in Germany in the 30s and 40s when the Nazis used those technologies. The Nazis took control of the propaganda machines of radio and television, and that could not have happened without those technologies. They were right to that process that they went through in the 1920s to think of like how do we how do we guard against these technologies being used by nefarious actors? They were right to be worried about that, and we saw that play out in the Second World War. What I think we're seeing now is the BBC. We're not seeing the most danger to the BBC, I think, coming from the hard power of, of governments telling them what to say and telling them what to do. Because if you, if, you look at, if you look at kind of British political culture, it's still a quite an adversarial relationship between journalism and, and politics, way more than in the US. Like British journalists, I, all British journalists are, are stunned up until Trump by how cosy the relationship is between the political journalists and the and the authorities and always was like there's a deference to power that in the in the US system or always was as I say up until Trump that we don't have in the UK like I think it's a healthier system but why I think the BBC is failing now and I think a lot of people are focused on like the woke takeover and I don't think the BBC is able to deal with the sort of social shaming like now what we're seeing is not kind of hard power, you must say this, coming from sort of government or whatever. What we're seeing is this diffuse soft power of shaming and influence through things like Twitter, through things like journalists self-censoring or 
following certain narratives that are partic that are kind of socially and culturally dominant, which I think is influencing the BBC. Like we need another uh, influence the BBC just as much as everyone else. And so I think what we need is some kind of process like the process that led to, because we now have a new set of technologies that are spreading like infinitely faster. We've got, we've got all of these big tech platforms that are diffusing all of this social pressure and are warping the world around us. And they're infinitely more powerful than even radio and TV. Like they're, they're personalizing echo chambers for everybody. They are splitting up any sense of shared reality at a, an exponentially growing rate. And we need some kind of process that led to something like the BBC to happen with the new tech pl platforms. And, and again, the, the, the objections that everyone will make is like, well, who would you trust to run that process? It's like, yeah, fair point. Like who, who could you even imagine that you would trust to run that kind of process in the world that we have now where everyone is considered to have taken a side on, on every, every topic. But I think that's what we need. And, and again, to say like, if, if the railroads were big enough to be broken up in the, in the 1920s, then surely the big tech platforms are big enough to be broken up now, like with the amount of strangleholds they have on the way we understand the world. Yeah, that was a bit of a rant, but, but it's something I've been thinking about quite a lot. I get it, man. What, 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 do you, what do you think? Do you think that's a fair summary of the... I mean, you know there's a lot of anti-BBC anti or anti-legacy media bias on, on YouTube that we'll probably see in the comments. Um, and I'll just get accused of being kind of BBC shill, but I well, think that's, I'm trying, nobody, nobody I think knows I'm trying to make a different kind of argument. Yeah, obviously you are still working for Channel 4, which is what nobody else knows, but that's the... That's the reason that you're pushing this, man. I, I don't know. I, this entire this entire conversation that we've have had and the reflections that I've had on it since, it just sort of opens up for every time that you glimpse the corner of an answer, four more questions arise, and there isn't a simple solution to this. To be honest, I think yeah, you know, it is beyond me to come up with some sort of a solution. But it's not beyond me to have conversations that can hopefully try and elucidate whether a solution is possible and so on and so forth. Uh, and that, I think, is the role that a lot of creators can take. You know, I don't understand the way that the mainstream media works the way that you do. I don't understand Ofcom and, and stuff like that. But that doesn't mean that the conversation can't be fruitful. That doesn't mean that people can't contribute. And this is what I think we've finished. It's been a little while since we had our first conversation, so I apologize if I'm repeating myself. But... This is what I suggested that the audience try to inject themselves into also. Like, look, like if you want to, if you want to improve the media landscape, if you care as much as the vitriolic comments suggest, then be a contributor, you know, like actually contribute to the conversation, stress test people's ideas in a good faith way. Um, yeah, that's some thoughts. I don't know whether I should take out the Channel Four stuff because there are some people who are going to think. There are some people who are going to think that's real. There are some people who are going to think that's real. Feel, feel free to take that out if you want to. I. Um, I don't know, I man. People like look. Something. Look at this shit. I mean, we've already got fucking Illuminati shit coming out of our. It doesn't. It doesn't take much. It's our own fault for choosing the logo, but. A little bit, yeah. Like, <laughs> I like the logo. Yeah. No, I think it's great. Like we wanted Iron Triangle, and the only. The only. The only thing we told the designer was not Illuminati, and then he came up with the like it's less Illuminati than it was. And then one of the one of the one of the first comments we had on the on the video was, um, "Your <laughs> your logo to Illuminati is fuck, but you seem legit." <laughs> <laughs> it's our own, it's our own fault. All I can say is like, if you're really that conspiratorial, it's like, would anyone who's really funded by the Illuminati be so stupid as to have a Illuminati logo as part of it. I think it might be good to sort of frame it a bit more narrowly in terms of like heterodox ideas, like heterodox ideas that are slightly outside the mainstream. Because I think we're, we're both kind of more or less in, in that space. Uh, we're, we're dealing with a lot of kind of sense-making challenges around kind of hot topics. Um, and I think that, that has been one of the key things that I've been wrestling with since the beginning. The Brett Weinstein and, and the Dark Horse being the most, the most recent one. It's like, what, what is the boundary? What is our obligation to our audience? And the thing that I was quite critical of 
with Brett was I wasn't seeing him bringing on people to challenge his narrative. He had on quite a lot of people who were making quite serious allegations about um, things to do with, with, with vaccines and very serious claims to do with them. And I wasn't seeing those things being, being truth checked. And, and for me, that, that felt like an obligation. That feels like an obligation to me if you're gonna make those kind of significant claims to, to in some way challenge those. Whether that's you take it on as the, as the interviewer and you put the, put the points to the people who are on there, which he wasn't doing and he doesn't have a broadcast background, he doesn't have a journalistic background. So again, I may be judging him way too harshly on that. But, but I do think then potentially bringing someone on who has a counterpoint. Balance is, the seesaw. Balance it a little bit on these topics. I mean, you can also argue that no, um, you are the, like with the Dark Horse podcast, by definition, that's sort of like, uh, it's, it's anti-consensus. So maybe he's making the anti-consensus point, which he's made with the idea of kind of like pushing the lab leak hypothesis. He didn't kind of have a balance of like, I thought it was, he, someone thought it was a lab leak, some, someone thought it wasn't. He pushed that narrative and potentially he was one of the things that shifted the dial on that going from conspiracy theory to actual real possibility. So I think that's a really interesting point there. But, but I, think, I think, for example, this is, this is the thing that unless you've worked in a newsroom, <laughs> People don't understand every single judgment that is made is contextual. This was a thing that surprised me when, when I was sort of part of the editorial discussions and kind of you have some idea of like, well, there's a rule book and you follow the rule book. It's like, no, no, every single thing is contextual. What do you mean by that? That, for example, I think there's a different set of, um, I think there's a different set of ethical obligations on a conversation around vaccines than there are about the lab leak hypothesis. The lab leak hypothesis is you could make a case that indirectly it affects people's lives because if it came from a lab, it was a potentially different virus and therefore the way that it behaved may have been different and like that would have affected the, the numbers of people who are infected by it and that, that would have affected the death toll. But when you come to stuff like the vaccines, like where you're putting out content that may make people make a decision to take them or not to take them and you have that clear health implication, I think that that raises the stakes, and there is a different ethical there is a different ethical judgment to be made there, and that happened all the time in a newsroom. Like depending on the stakes, depending on who it affected, depending on whether it affected. Because this, I worked in foreign news a lot, and some of the stories you're telling, it's like, will reporting this affect the safety of a person in this country, where this information has come from? Like those those questions are taken incredibly seriously in newsrooms. Like those those obligations to the people where the information has come from, but for example, on the on the kind of ivermectin vaccines, dark horse, that was why I put out the film about ivermectin first, because I felt like okay, ivermectin as a treatment, in particular, is a different ethical case to to asking about the dangers of the vaccines, because if you've got COVID and you take ivermectin, whether it works or not, and how strong the data is around that, and the different claims. That's not directly affecting people's health in the same way as, but I think when you start talking about ivermectin as a prophylactic, as a prevention, as a potentially replacement for vaccines, that clearly has more health implications. And I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't discuss that, but I think you get a whole different set of considerations and I think a different set of obligations in fact checking um, as best as you can and challenging your thinking as best as you can and trying to reflect different perspectives as best as you can, the more the, the stakes are raised. The difference in degrees whether, whether, so whether you're, that whether you're vaccine, in now. Yeah, whether you're vaccine, and this is not whether, this is not me saying, I hope it's not me saying, well, if you're going to make an anti-vaccine argument. It applies to ivermectin, but not to the vaccine. Well, well, I also think like it applies on, on, both, on both sides. Once you get into this, and, and I agree with Brett when he says, look, I'm making, I'm putting out, I'm asking questions about the safety of the vaccines that if I'm right and they are more dangerous than people are, are saying, then this is another ethical obligation. And I agree with him. And I think that a lot of the time the argument from the legacy or the mainstream is, Brett, you're just playing with fire and you need to stop it. And his point is like, you may be playing with fire and you need to stop it as well. Like I, I agree with Brett, like you can't play that, you can't play it just one way. So I, I agree with his point that, that whether he's right or wrong, there are health implications. But, I, but my concern is that I wasn't seeing him, 
But you could argue that the mainstream is not considering the counterpoint, but I also wasn't seeing him considering the counterpoint. And I think, given the stakes, I, and we don't have any hard and fast rules, but I'd like to, to think about what a, what a sort of set of principles might be for us to interrogate. How do we interrogate heterodox, potentially dangerous ideas in a responsible way? As I tried to do with the ivermectin story, like I had someone who, who argued for and someone who argued against, and people can make up their own minds. That, for me, is a journalistic way of treating these kind of topics. When you're compelled by something, as presumably Brett is with this, incredibly compelled, you can feel like the cause that you're, you're fighting for is so righteous that with the lab leak hypothesis, as you said, Brett had no requirement, as far as he was concerned, to bring somebody else on that was pro-zoonotic, right? I would say that when there's a public health implication, that that difference in degree is so great that it probably does constitute a difference in kind. But that isn't the viewpoint that somebody that is unbelievably compelled and feels in their heart of hearts that this is the correct line to go down. That's just, that's just not how they're going to see it. Yeah, I, I saw at the end of your um, video about when the film got taken down that you guys did, which is now back up, uh, you mentioned about this, some form, some code of, of conduct, of ethics, and this kind of shows, I suppose, your uh, heritage coming in from the legacy media, coming in from that sort of traditional journalistic background. Um, there are, as I'm sure you're aware, a whole host of questions that you'd need to ask there. How is it judged? Who is it that's going to enact it? What are the penalties if you do? What do you get if you do? Because what you're saying to creators is, is I want to restrict or I want to hold you to a standard that you may not want to hold yourself to. Well, not I necessarily. Can we agree uh, to uh, hold ourselves to a standard? The royal we, the group, sure. um, wants to hold people to a standard that they may, okay, so I'm going to have to pay a price for this. I'm going to have to learn more. I'm going to have to be more mindful. I'm going to have to spend more time quizzing my questions through this particular framework. What am I going to get out of this is another question. And I think that the main... And this may be a terrible idea, by the way. So oh, it's yeah. Not like well, having... It's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the benefit from my perspective would be, is there something that as content creators we can do that gives us some kind of safety in numbers? Because at the moment... What we're do you in, mean by safety in numbers? The, I mean, at the moment, YouTube is making the decisions in an ad hoc, completely random way. Like they took down the ivermectin film that we put out, didn't say why, they put it back up, they didn't say why. With this, how much do you think that those decisions are made by a human that fully understands what's going on? I believe that it was made by an algorithm and then it was checked by a human, but I don't know why it was put back up. I'm sure I would imagine the fact that I was able to say, I, I've worked for Channel 4 and the BBC for nearly 20 years in my appeal would have, would have gone in my favor and other people wouldn't have that. So my, my sense is just to frame it in terms of like what the benefits are. Is there a way that content creators who are wanting to interrogate heterodox ideas in a responsible way could come up with a set of kind of good faith principles that we could all sign up to? And then that would be some kind of safety in numbers in terms of like if one of us got kind of hit with a, cop, with a community guideline strike or whatever, we could say, no, no, we've been, we've been playing by these rules. Um, and then all of us could either put that, I don't know, maybe all of us put that film up on our channels together or kind of assuming that they couldn't take down all of us if we were big enough. Um, I don't know, it may be a terrible idea, but it's sort of like, a, is there a sort of, because I, I, I'm tired of this constant, like, only focus on the big tech platforms. Like, it feels very adolescent to me to just be kind of shouting about censorship, even though it's, a, it's obviously a very relevant issue. I think censorship is downstream from, from healthy sense making and healthy, um, I, I think censorship is the, is the last resort when things have gone wrong a, l a lot further down the, down the chain. And I'm also aware, like even as I'm speaking, like, I, I'm aware that people are almost certainly writing in the comments right now as they're watching it, ah, well, th like free speech absolutism is such a kind of dominant narrative on YouTube. Like, what are you even talking about? You're just bringing back gatekeeping. Uh, you just put you're out what information. You're something that's now decentralized. You're, 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 yeah, you, good, good ideas. The only solution for bad speech is good speech. That is an ideology. 
That is an ideological position that is very widespread on YouTube and any hint that you might, you might sort of be in favor of censorship, although I think there's very little understanding like there's a difference between censorship and moderation and curation. Like every, into that for me. Every single decision we make at all times is a curatorial decision. Like you're censoring something by deciding to put something on and not something else. You are, if you're going to make that argument, like you are, you are every single decision you're making is a moderation or a, cu or a curation decision. And the idea that good speech will, that good speech is the solution for bad speech is an ideological position in this alternative media landscape where that we have an infinity of information that that is true is not proven by, by any means. But it also presumes that the good speech will beat the bad speech because people judge things that are wrong because of their uh, precision, because of how sexy they are, because of how they're presented all the time. You can make very rational people believe very irrational things by making it incredible. I mean, look at Love Island. Look at how many people watch that mm -hmm. as a good example. So you need to be very, very careful about how you try and restrict this. I agree. The internet doesn't like restrictions on free speech at all. Yeah, and I'm not arguing for restrictions on free speech. I'm arguing for something, like I think censorship is the wrong answer, but I do think it's about how you create healthy ecosystems. Communities are generally become self-policing because of, because of healthy social norms, because of the way that people interact with each other, the way that the different forms of behavior are rewarded and different forms of behavior are promoted. Like that happens naturally in healthy communities. How do we move more, to, more towards that is one of the, the central questions. How would you get membership into this particular group? I don't know, and I don't, I mean, this is, this is the, I don't know if this is, a, if, if this is the, the right answer. I do, I do think it's worth putting down a set of principles and seeing whether people would be interested to sign up to it. I mean, there have been sort of various examples of something similar in, in different areas, like the, the Dogme School of Filmmaking, where kind of a whole set of filmmakers decided to turn their backs on kind of artificial light and like they would make things for a certain, in a certain way. Um, there's also, yeah, a, a lot of different kind of bodies, a lot of different sort of trade bodies started as people sort of committing to certain standards and other people committed to certain standards and that became kind of a, a, a thing. So I think, I think it's certainly worth putting together a set of sort of principles of good faith dialogue, of healthy inquiry into ideas and seeing whether people would, would sign up to that. Industry standards exist pretty much everywhere. And when you think about how many people podcasts and YouTube reach and the impact that you have on the public consciousness, the fact that it's, that this doesn't exist, the fact that we saw Darren Grimes as the first person that I'd ever seen be culpable for something that his guest said. And then, I don't know if you noticed this, um, an Irish host of a program said something about JK Rowling, maybe accused her of being transphobic. This is probably about six months ago or so. Mm -hmm. And what you saw there were the exact same people that said, I can't believe that Darren Grimes has been called in to the police station for a voluntary interview after he didn't push back sufficiently against David Starkey. Um, and then JK Rowling won the exact same situation, but flipped with the other, the, the in-group now being the out-group. And there was celebration. Yep, completely, quite rightly so. And you think you can't have it both ways. So yeah, industry standards exist across pretty much everything. The impact of podcasts is so high that it's surprising that we've got through that. Someone said not long ago, podcasting now and YouTube now feels like the internet in the early 2000s. Mm. Total free for all, no standards. People can do whatever they want. There's not even advertising standards. P Instagram influencers have to put hashtag ad on their, in on their adverts. You can drop products mid roll during your episode and not declare that you're being paid for it. Like there is, it's just moving so quickly that the behemoth Leviathan that mm. is red tape and legislation it's not catching up, but it will catch up. And as you push the envelope of, the, the internet likes to be libertarian with stuff, right? Like it's somewhere that's free, it doesn't have this control. And over the last 16 months, the institutions haven't exactly done themselves a great service of saying, no worries, trust in us. We're actually 
competent at our jobs. Like they've done the complete opposite of that. Um, but it is going to be such a long road to go through with this. Like what if being associated with this particular um, set of guidelines makes all of the programs sound the same, makes everyone's creation sound the same? What if it's so restrictive that the only way that you can get, um, how would you say, not dictatorial, but um, kind of prescripted or advised sense making done in a particular manner is to lose all of the things that make it compelling in the first place. And everybody literally does switch to Love Island because it's the only uh, entertaining thing that's left on their screens. There is, there's a lot of challenges here. It's interesting you mentioned the London Real thing before because that was the that was the time that I that I felt like I really pushed the boundaries in terms of what I was doing compared to what I was used to. Like when I did the first film about London Real, um, Brian Rose, after he did the interview with with David Icke, and then kind of launched this scammy digital freedom platform that was clearly channeling the money directly into his own pocket while claiming it was independent of himself, like. And I kind of followed this story and it was like, what, what is going on here? And I, I initially played it all completely by the book in terms of like, write a reply, um, asking for interviews, like really, really clear, talking to, talking to lawyers. And then over time, I, I still kind of offered write a reply and there was an open invitation for him to kind of come, come, come on the, the channel. Obviously he didn't seem to want to do that. But but my language got more and more combative. Like I, I started take doing things I would never have done had I been at, uh, yeah, a, a kind of le a legacy media outlet, where I sort of started getting a, a lot more direct, and I felt justified in doing that. Like I also felt like, no, he's 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 lying and lying and lying. Like you would never call someone a liar, for example. You would never use the word scam. You would always kind of hedge your language quite a lot if you're working Full for a legacy. Liability. Well, just every journalist has a, an allergic reaction when they, like if you, if you submitted a story to an editor and it had the word scam in it, uncaveated, or this person lied, you would, they, would, they would look for a way to take that out because that's, you, you're opening yourself up to legal action. Like you, you've got that kind of buzzer that goes off in your mind. But what do you do if someone is actually lying? What do you do if this is obviously a scam? And so I was kind of aware that when I, when I wrote, so I wrote an article for Unheard, and that had the very sort of toned down language that I knew would be suitable for a kind of legacy media outlet. Um, but when I did the, the, the similar piece for the channel, I said, no, it's a, it's a scam. The digital freedom platform was a scam. He's now lying, he's taken this money, he's now running for London mayor. And it was, it was language I would never have used and never been able to use in, in kind of a, a mainstream media outlet. And I was sort of learning to sort of push the boundaries more and more and more within the kind of alternative media. And I think obviously people on YouTube want that, but it's fascinating that the people who are doing that and using those words, like none of them are getting legal advice. Like if they were to get attacked or if they were to have a, a, a legal action against them, I think they would be pretty screwed. Like there's a lot of people making films out there who have no idea that they're playing with fire. And if they were to get, yeah, if, 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 if a media lawyer was to take it seriously and start kind of saying, okay, right, we're gonna, we're gonna start suing you, I think a lot of people would be very exposed. We talk about the different backgrounds that people come into this industry from. And you're showing there that sort of YouTube is, the game is seducing you a little bit there, that you're thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you felt um, the language, the direct language helped get your point across in a way that was uh, sufficiently aggressive to properly convey how you felt. And the fact that I don't need to equivocate here, this is what it is, it is a scam, he is a liar. But on the same side, as um, Eric said to you, David, you're, you're getting me on because you know this will make money, you know, this will get views. And you're like, yeah, okay, like that, you know, that is part of the elephant in the room. Like th there is a degree of game playing here that we need to do. Otherwise, we would all just have black backgrounds with white text as our thumbnails. Why do we do thumbnail design? It's because we want people to click on the videos because we think that they're, and this is what I think is really interesting, that, mm. that how much game playing yeah. is permissible within this, how much 
um, of the charade of the back and forth within this? Should every interview? Well, and how how much, for example, let's take clickbait titles as an example. I I mean, it, it's it's an act of faith as well, is that that's not a good idea long term because if you do that long term, you're going to kind of affect your relationship with the people who are viewing. You're going to get more views, but they're going to be lower quality views, and the the sense that. Again, this is all contextual. This is all also still contextual. Depends on who you're speaking to, yeah. Yeah, it depends on who you're speaking to, and also it, it's about whether you are wanting to be, whether you're willing to, cre to trade your credibility in the long term for short term goals, which is an act of faith in itself. Like you're assuming that that will be the case. But there's always, like you say, there's always a, there's always a, it, it's a dynamic system in the same way that every editorial decision is contextual. M making it in a nicer studio, upgrading yeah. the camera and the sound equipment. Well, you know, you can justify that as it, it improves the, the viewer's uh, experience. Mm. Okay, and you just slippery slope it all the way from that to, you know, googly eyes, Minnie Mouse appeared in the middle of my night. Oh my, oh my God, guys. Like that, you know, it's, it's just TikTok reels all the way down as far as I can see with stuff like that. And, um, it is, it is a difficult decision to make, especially given, you know, you just said that you had a little bit of assistance with this huge document, which is very well researched around ivermectin, COVID vaccines, so on and so forth. There isn't, there isn't a huge team of people here. I don't know how big the team is that's behind Brett's channel. I don't know how big the team is that's behind Eric's channel, but I bet. We're all outside the institutions relatively. But it won't be anywhere near as big proportionally as it should be for the size of the impact that it's having. And also the kind of topics that we're trying to engage with. Yeah, the series. Um, I mean, the, you touched on the more sort of, um, I won't say superficial, but yeah, well, the, the more, well, the, the more superficial aspects of like, like, how do you choose your titles? How do you choose your, your um, design for title cards, et cetera, et cetera. Like the more interesting thing is the guests that you're choosing to, get, to have on and that phenomenon of audience capture mm -hmm. that, w that I think, I think like my, my interest in, in the intellectual dark web that, that sort of started in early 2018 was I think a steady, many of the people within that I think fell victim to audience capture. That you start, you start following you start off genuinely, I think Dave Rubin is the perfect example. Dave Rubin is, there's an amazing series of films by a guy called Timber on Toast, which I think perfectly show what happens. Dave Rubin, I think, started genuinely as a disaffected liberal saying, look, I've seen that there's some problems on the left. And I don't think he had the ability to withstand what then became a sort of steady slide into um, the kinds of guests that he was having on, the kinds of questions that he was and wasn't asking people and it became more and more he became more and more partisan less and less of a kind of genuine truth seeker so the the reason that you feel that that is um something worthy of bringing up and that dave is culpable for his actions is that he could have acted otherwise it's not that he was incapable of asking the questions it's not that he didn't have access to these other people yes i i think if you're only going for views like there's plenty of examples within the kind of the area of YouTube that we are in, I know I could have got a huge amount of more views by just churning out anti-woke content. Like anti-woke content would have got the views. I'm not interested, I'm not, I don't think that's what, that's not what, what moves me, that's not what moves rebel wisdom. Um, but it's also something that's cost in terms of views. There are plenty of examples of people who, who've not made those decisions or have, or have compromised in some way. And I, I don't think that's a long-term winning strategy but that's, an, that's a sort of a, a question of, of, of faith as well, that that's not a long-term strategy. I think if your aim is, I think if your aim is truth-seeking, like genuine truth-seeking and then being willing to challenge your audience, being willing to, to follow it wherever it may lead, then I think audience capture is a, is, a, is a real problem that we all need to be aware of. And we're all subject to that in the same way that the, whenever any of us are on Twitter or any of us are on um, Facebook, that you start your your persona and your and the reality starts to kind of the, a gap starts to open up. I think that's it. that process that happens to every single person when they go on social media, especially on Instagram, happens in accelerated form to content creators.
Like I think because of the amount of feedback that we get, the, the fact that we've got a comments thread, the fact that we're putting out interviews, like I think it, it becomes an accelerated process and that becomes a warping factor around us that, that is the, the, the perils of sense making in the alternative media landscape. Well, remember that most creators, or at least a, a significant portion of creators, are essentially making these editorial decisions on their own. Most of them don't come from even close to a journalistic background, and even your journalistic background doesn't prepare you for 3,000 comments underneath a video. And you sent me a, a video of Sam and, and Eric having a discussion talking about how poor the quality of the comments and the criticism is. It gets to the stage where you think, well, what's the point in even trying to sift through this? Uh, for every comment that may be in good faith, well-balanced, well-educated and well-meaning are 30, 50, 100 that are just links to Russian porn sites and somebody that's got an axe to grind and somebody that didn't like your use of this particular word, whatever it might be, that I gave. And also like Eric and Sam's point was really that they were, were failing, they felt they were getting worse and worse because they were not able to perceive good criticism anymore. Because they got so many bad versions of criticism, they actually... Desensitized to whatever's going desensitized, on. Desensitized, like they would basically sort of pattern match any criticism as being one of the bad arguments they'd already had. Yeah, it's a challenging one. I had a situation not long ago where a clip that I'd put up with Douglas Murray on my Instagram had been popped by somebody or a group of people that didn't like the fact that I'd laughed at a joke that Douglas had made. They'd taken that as me complying with it and agreeing with what he'd said, and they decided to send that in ahead of a talk that I was giving. And when this happened, I got contacted by the guys that were running the talk, and they said, look, Chris, you, you should know there is, we've had a number of different people. This clip was eight months old in the arse end of my Instagram. The only way that multiple people could have sent it in is if it was coordinated, but that didn't matter. Multiple people, they were concerned. In this it, cancel culture is something that to people that run events is, is quite serious. And uh, they said, look, this is, this is something that you should be aware of. Don't respond if you get any tweets online. Don't subtweet them. Don't try and take the piss out of them. Don't do what you sometimes do. Um, we'll, just, we'll just keep quiet for now. And I responded and said, look, are you, are you thinking of cutting me from the lineup of this particular event? And I didn't get a response for half a day and then for another day. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And then another thought process came in my mind that was this allure of the potential cancellation. And I thought, this could be my thing. This could be my, my evergreen state. This could be my Bill C-16. Like this could be the rallying point that I get. And I started to almost sort of romanticize the potential of being this cancelled for a laugh. You know, you can almost, the, the, the tweets almost write themselves. I'll get it printed on a t-shirt. I'll do, you know, Zuby's okay, dude. Like, you know, I'll, and you just think, I can make an in-group and out-group out of this so easily and people will rally around me. And then you sort of shake it off and you think, what, what are you doing? Like, that's just pure ego, but it happens. And these are the sort of questions that every creator wrestles with. And the guys came back, I kept my mouth shut, I didn't reply to any of the tweets, so on and so forth, and everything continued forward fine. Um, but there was a moment where I thought, I could this, use this. This cancellation could really work for me. This clout could be my shelling point. This could be the thing. You know, cancelled for a laugh. Douglas Murray's a good mate. Oh, Douglas, can you see how ridiculous this thing is? Blah, blah, blah. Slippery. Yeah. And I think, I think that's something that maybe audiences are not so alert for. Like, those are such, those are such powerful weapons. Like, censorship is a very powerful weapon. Being cancelled is a very powerful weapon. And obviously, sometimes that's true, but a lot of the time, it's not that simple. And I think looking for that kind of rallying point on the other side of like, fuck the man, is, is, a, is, a, really tempta is a really tempting place to be. The like it's a tempting narrative. And I think people are, especially in this sort of heterodox space, and this is one of the points again I made about um, around the Dark Horse content, Brett's content was, let's be aware of the whole story. Like the whole story, so half the story is, look at all the warping factors on the mainstream. 
look at how consensus is enforced, look at the, look at the, 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 big, um, the big money factors that are enforcing um, yeah, conformity of narrative and punishing. It's like, yeah, that's true. But also look at the warping factors on the other side, which is like the compelling narrative of sticking it to the man, of being the one who is kind of speaking the truth. Like, like those, those are also incredibly powerful narratives that people respond to immediately. And those are like, this is, this is the thing I think that we, we really need to, fundamentally, I think it's, it's a little bit adolescent to be stuck in the one kind of oppositional mindset. I think we need to be much more aware of the drivers on both sides. Like let's tell, as Jordan Peterson, like I think Jordan Peterson summed it up really well, where he said like an ideology is, is half the story. Like he's basically said, the difference between a religion and an ideology, a religion is the whole story. It's a uh, benevolent mother and evil crone. It's, um, it's, it's nature as, um, wild, as pristine wilderness and nature that will kill you. Like religion is a, is a worldview that tells you the whole story. And ideology is a parasite on that religious structure because it only tells you half the story. Like an ideology is, um, yeah, is 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 heart is effectively a fragmentary religion. I think that's really like you can you can apply that kind of everywhere. It's like beware if anyone's telling you half the story, and beware when you're being kind of driven by that half the story in some kind of way. I mean, going back to to Brian Rose and London Real, he knew that like he did that incredibly well. We will not be silenced. We will not be censored, and we will not be stopped. Now is the time to join the resistance and join London Real. The digital freedom platform is happening, all right? It's gonna be in full effect tomorrow. If you wanna be a part of that, go to londonreal.tv forward slash freedom, become a founding member of this platform. Some people don't get it, all right? And some people do get it. Some people wanna be counted, and your name will be there etched in stone as someone who helped us fight on the front lines for freedom. Or do you wanna be someone who sat back and let others fight for your freedom? That's the question. Very sophisticated, man. Very sophisticated, or at least very, very effective in terms of passing people from their money. He knew when he, when he got David Icke on, he knew what David Icke was gonna say. He knew that in those early, like really intense days that David Icke pretty much told people to take the law into their own hands at a time when 5G towers were being burned down, said humanity needs to get off its knees. He's clever enough to sort of not directly incite violence and tell people to go out and burn things down, but he came as close as he possibly could to doing it and said COVID was a hoax, it was caused by 5G. If you don't get off your knees now, like this is incredibly inflammatory stuff and they knew Brian Rose knew that was going to be taken down. Like, I don't think YouTube had any choice in taking that down at that particular time. And then it all just, he just it's kind of rolled, ro he, ro streams and freedom platforms he, ro he them, rolled it out. He got nearly a million dollars off. Are you going to get off your knees? Are you going to let the big tech platforms dictate to you? Are you going to like he he played that he played that like a fiddle? So that to me is something that everybody needs to be very cautious of because this in group and out group dynamic is something that gets weaponized very very easily, and this is why the sort of dunking mentality of the internet can be really dangerous because what you're bonding with other people over is hatred of an out group, not shared love of an in group. And that's, that's like, it's weak, as in it fragile. doesn't bind, yep, yeah, correct, it's fragile, it doesn't bind together very well. Um, it, it gives you all of the senses of community without any of the things that community is supposed to give you. Like you're not actually coming together around anything that's shared other than hatred of something else. And, but that can be really, really super powerful. And that was what I saw, that was what I felt. I'm like, oh, this could be it. I could get, you know what I mean? I could, oh, I could get everyone around me because easy narrative, lazy thinking, limbic hijack, there we go. The man shutting me down, Douglas Murray, bit of clout, a small podcaster from the north of England, canceled for, for a laugh. And you just think, there it is. Recognizing that and recognizing that as an audience member as well. Like, look, am I 
in love with this creator or am I simply hating the outgroup that they keep on pointing at? Because those aren't the same thing. Yeah. I also wanted to pick up on something we talked about a bit about kind of the social dynamics of... Because the other thing that YouTube has done, especially with the kind of the, the rise of the public intellectuals on, on YouTube and, and elsewhere, is this sort of sense of there's a lot of people who maybe have become popular for the very first time. And you see these kind of warping effects of fame and these warping effects of people probably in, in their 50s, 60s becoming kind of something that they never had in... Like Joe Rogan is a good counterexample, I think, of someone who is able to stay grounded despite all, all of his success because you get the feeling he's always been a, a job. Of the tree. Yeah, he's always been sort of top of the tree in various ways. Whereas I've seen with so many of, of these other figures that it just either goes to your head or you get pressures that you just don't know how to deal with. And like it, it certainly become, it seems to become a kind of, um, yeah, really um, dangerous terrain when you sort of step into that. Status is a hell of a drug, man. Like if you are someone that has spent a lot of your life feeling like you had talent, but the world didn't recognize it, like you coulda, woulda, shoulda been something, and then finally the world recognizes what your, your brilliance. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's powerful. That's very compelling. And it's hard to not start believing your own height. How, do how does anyone remain humble like that, you know? And it, it's, it's not easy. I mean, again, you know, to not bring up Love Island one too many times more, but you see this with people that are plucked out of obscurity and then six weeks later given them two million followers and an entire country knows their name. These people are not built to deal with this. Now roll that forward, double their life or maybe triple their life, these 20 year olds to people that are older, maybe they've spent their entire careers working away as research assistants or you know, hardcore academic texts. You think finally now you have never had status in the way that you've wanted it and now you're put at the top of a mountain. What do you do? How do you stop your ego from getting out of control? What control mechanisms do you have? And now everybody's looking to you as some sort of sense maker. Like it's, it, it deserves sort of sympathy f from us for the person that's in that situation. I know that's a very unpopular view. Think, oh, how hard is it to have all of these views and have all of these people listening to what you say? Mm. But all of the pressure is now on that person to be some sort of like, omnipotent... Epistemic authority is the, is the words that my friend Peter uses. What does that mean? Um, epistemic authority means someone who kind of says believes that they are able to articulate kind of how it is in a way like you you have the authority to do, to to like that's essentially what a public intellectual is and it's something i find very like i, I see myself much more as a curator i think when it comes to some of these topics about the media landscape i start to come more into my kind of area where i feel like i've got some more insight maybe than don't yeah, just if I'd input them, then maybe others others do. But generally, I've avoided that. Like, I don't consider myself an epistemic authority. Like, I, I consider someone like Eric Weinstein or Daniel Schmachtenberger or Jordan Hall, like those kind of people. You put a, you put the microphone in front of them, and they tell you what they think. think. They tell you what they think, and it's always fascinating. It's brilliant. It's it's kind of like they, they are epistemic authorities. But everybody has bounds. Everybody has these boundaries and learning where they are if you are catapulted to the top of the mountain of status. How do you keep that under control? Well, everybody thinks that my view on the vaccine is correct, so maybe I should start talking about mm. abortion or marriage or gun rights or politics, or maybe I should start this party or maybe I should do whatever. Like, yeah. this is, it, it's hard to learn where the boundaries of your own competence lie. Yeah, and it's compounded by the platforms it's compounded by the infinity of feedback that we get now in the digital media landscape which means that we're able to we get an infinity of, of input so we can pretty much screen out the bad stuff and just we still get an infinity of positive reinforcement like that's why it's so ungrounding to be in that position we, we we've got we're not 
we're not designed to deal with that level of input. And so because of our confirmation bias, because of our kind of narcissism and all of these things, which all of the platforms are deliberately designed by Stanford engineers to weaponize and to work on, it's a losing battle. Like we are, so we're, we're all completely ungrounded in this, in this because, of, because of the nature of these platforms. Which is why I think you, ultimately this conversation ends for me with, as it does with Daniel Schmachtenberger, is with personal growth. I think we need to have a much more sophisticated conversation, a much more sophisticated understanding of our own drivers, to really start looking at our own drivers, build really trusted relationships, really deep trusted relationships with others who can call us out on our bullshit, who can tell us when we're getting over, when we're kind of starting to lose it. Like, I don't see the, the kind of stuff that I'm aware of from particularly men's work, like do, doing kind of, we, we've led men's, men's retreats for a while. We do exercises where it's like, okay, learn to take like proper feedback, get those really deep relationships with other men where you can call each other out on your bullshit. You can, you can kind of loving but firm accountability and, and the deep kind of, you need to be able to do the kind of inner work of like real self-reflection, real self-reflection, real kind of awareness of like, how am I being hijacked? Oh, where's that? Oh, wow, that's that thing from school coming up again. Like, I, I, I'm recognizing, I don't see, I don't think any of us can do it. And this is maybe getting more into a more interesting area than the idea of creating a sort of code of conduct. I think because culture eats strategy for breakfast anyway. So how can we create a culture of people where we have those kind of relationships? Well, man, the difference between having a rote set of rules that everybody has to adhere to and some kind of uh, very bureaucratic uh, way of deploying them versus having a Slack channel that's got all of the people that would have been in that, the social pressure that you would get, the desire to conform in the right way would be much more scalable than trying to come up with one rule for every single different way that it's gonna go because you're going to know when you've got it wrong even if the people that you're speaking to can't quite precisely tell you how you've got it wrong. Mate, you're off the mark there. Why? Okay, well, here's the closest approximation I can find. Could you put it into a rule? No, but could you tell me so that I believe you and so that I don't do it again? Yes. So I think, I think you're, uh, that would be a much more effective control mechanism. But another thing to consider as well is... I wouldn't call it a control mechanism. I think that... that assistance feels... mechanism? I don't know, like flight guidance? Yeah, it's more... It, it, like, that for me feels like the wrong attitude. It's not like... It's not the id or the... Sorry, it's not the superego kind of pressing down. Yeah, it's more a kind of... It's more a kind of helpful reflection. I mean, that's the other thing. At, at some point, if you, get, if you get deep enough into personal growth, is like you start to desire those kind of relationships you start to desire those kind of reflections it's like please show me my blind spots the the, the drawback is there's a lot of people who i hear saying those words who i don't think it's a signal of good faith well i don't i think we also bullshit ourselves we also get to the point where we're like no we you know what i i really want i really want feedback i really want to engage my critics yeah. and ultimately we end up bullshitting ourselves there's some reason why we can't engage this particular critic or this particular critic and, and there's, there's a reason why um, that piece of feedback doesn't land particularly, or you've got me wrong this time, or whatever. It's like, like we've got, it's, it's really, really hard. And I don't know how we do it outside, outside of those kind of trusted relationships. I don't think we can do it outside those trusted relationships. Another thing that you could propose would be for the audience to be better of themselves. Would be, look, like if you are listening to your favorite creator, week in, week out. I'm sure it's the same with you guys. One message from someone that says, hey man, I, I listened to your episode with Yon Mi Park or with Danny Trejo or whoever, uh, and it was, it was awesome. That's worth 10,000 plays, 50,000 plays, because it really does, because the plays are constantly coming, mm. but the messages are different. And then the times when I've had long, well thought out, obviously well-meaningful, effortful messages from people that have said, hey man, I listen every week to Modern Wisdom, you you're wrong about this, you're off the mark. I'll take my time to reply, I'll put it into an, if it's an Instagram DM, I'll pull it across into my emails, can I have your email, I want to reply to this in full on a, on a proper keyboard. So the audience has an obligation, well, they don't have an obligation, but they have the opportunity mm. to contribute here. 
Do you want your favorite creator to be better than they are right now? Okay, well, make your comments better. Like, tell us where we're going wrong in a way that's not going to be so inflated. Like, don't do it looking for likes. If that's the game you want to play, then fine, but you're not a part of the conversation. Mm. Then you can make a dialogue. Like, we check the comments. They're there. People will skim through them. The YouTube Studio app is open every so often. Like, if you have, oh, reach out. Everyone's got a contact email. And if you can be bothered to write out something that's well thought out, that will help. You can be the flight guidance mechanism for your favorite creator. And if you find someone that you resonate with and you're listening to them all the time, help them be better. Like you're literally a part of that project then. You don't need to sign up for the Patreon. You don't have to be on locals or in some Telegram group. You can contribute to the way that your favorite creator is making content that you listen to by giving them guidance and feedback and praise. Yeah, I really like the the natural arc of the conversation from kind of what was a kind of fairly haphazard thought about a kind of code of conduct, which which may, I mean, I mean the the other point that Daniel Schmachtenberger makes quite a lot is that you can't codify it. If you codify anything, then you create loopholes, you create incentive structures for people to sort of like meet the letter of the law, Good but not law kicks in with everything. Yeah, the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. So it, at the very, at most, it has to be a set of principles. Um, and I know he's thought quite a lot about those set of principles. And I think um, there are some that I've absorbed through, just through osmosis of being in this, in this space for, for a while. And one of the hardest things to, to deal with, and this came up in the, in the Brett situation, is we're juggling public and private in a way that doesn't exist in the institutions. This is, this is a completely new Don't landscape. To, John Snow doesn't need to keep his friendship with interviewee number 55 that he's got on tomorrow night. Yeah, uh, but also it's, it's more John Snow and, and a sort of similar person in the BBC. Like uh, um, the institutions sort of protect you in a way with a set of sort of formalized roles and responsibilities that mean that you don't have to think too much about the personal relationships with the others. And there's also a kind of, within the media, there is, there is generally a sort of truce that they're not going to attack each other. They're not going to kind of, it's, it's pretty rare for one media organization to report on another. It has happened. And like, like I think of The Guardian reporting on the news of the world, for example, it's, it's pretty rare. It has to be like a really extreme kind of case of and obviously the BBC is reported on by everyone. Like the, the, the press will kind of dive on, on stories about the BBC, quite rightly because they're paid by everyone through the TV license. Do you think there's a more of a performative aspect in the mainstream media or in the YouTube world? I think there's a different performative aspect in, in, either, in, in both of them. Because the interesting thing that everyone has, especially with YouTubers, is, is that you'll probably follow them on Twitter as well and maybe you follow them on Instagram, and if they do Instagram stories, you know what their dog's called, and you know the sort of car that they drive, and you know where they go for breakfast, and stuff like that. So you have this very compulsive level of connection. You resonate with that creator, which means that you have even less rationality around what it is that they should and shouldn't be saying. Mm -hmm. um, so if you see something that you feel is disingenuous from them, how much should they be performing? How much is their performance carried across into what you see of them behind the screen? Like, I, I don't know whether the performative aspect of when you see a, um, a Jordan Peterson interview with Kathy Newman, mm. and then can they go away and shake hands and say sort of good, well played, sir. Mm. Uh, that doesn't exist in podcasting as much, unless you want to completely annihilate your relationships with people because there is a sense that this is more organic, mm. that this is, I'm here, you have invited me, we are in a room together that isn't you coming to work. We've yeah. chosen to do this because we think that there's something worthwhile to get out of it. Mm. And that changes the dynamic again. That's another layer that you need to try and navigate and that the audience needs to navigate as well. I really think that active listening, not in trying to remember what people have said, but in, okay, what is, is this creator getting right? What are they getting wrong? Where is the sense making going awry? How have they been hijacked? How have I been hijacked? How can I help them be better? I think that these are, these are the really interesting parts. And then creating some sort of a community that would be not self-enforcing, but uh, self-optimizing. Mm. That would be, I, I would struggle to think of a more powerful uh, way to improve the information landscape. Yeah. 
Yeah, I like I like that um, we've ended in this in this place because it feels like the sort of the right yeah the 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 right place to end. Um, and I could, yeah, the, the, there's a kind of I think the people who you would want to go on that kind of shared journey with would have um, a similar set of principles. So my friend Peter, I mentioned before, Peter Lindbergh, who runs the Stoa, talks about friendships of virtue. Um, What's that mean? The idea that, I, I think it's a Stoic idea, um, and it's compared to, I think, friendships of, like friendships of comfort or friendships of pleasure. Friendships of virtue are that you're holding, you're holding yourselves to a higher ethical standard. So your friendship is actually to the ethical standard with each other. And a little bit like Jordan Peterson talks about the, the best in each other, like the, the highest potential in each other. Like that's the thing that we're actually committing to in a friendship and that we are wanting the best of each other. So therefore we're calling out when, when we fall short of that. And how can we have these kind of friendships of virtue where we are, um, we're not worrying so much about each other's feelings in the moment as this sense that we're both oriented towards that sense of the highest good that we're, yeah, that, that we're trying to call out of each other through. And I think for me, that's a, that's a very, that, that's what I've tried to, cultivate in in many of my relationships since I started kind of doing personal growth work 15 years ago or so like that's 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 the thing that like how can how can we hold each other to higher standards how can we kind of build these kind of relationships that are much more based on truth and not based on convenience and not based on sort of telling people what they want to hear but what what's really true um, for us and in the moment what I think is really interesting there is that as a audience member or as a fellow creator watching somebody else anyone else's content that they put out you can ask yourself like do i actually think that this person wants to do this well that's a really good question to ask like is this person trying to do this well forget the fact that they may not have the journalistic training that you do or the verbal agility that jordan peterson does are they working as well as they can because it is practicing in public. That's what we're doing. Podcasting is practicing in public. There are no dry runs. We haven't gone and sat down and done whatever this has been, an hour and a half, two hours of chatting away and then come in here and then redone it. So because of that- It would have, have been quite shit if we had as well, I think. Yeah, would yeah, have felt a little bit would have been more slick. Um, Probably. But if you think that your favorite creator is genuinely trying to do the thing that they do well. I care about what I do. I know that you do. I care about getting it right. I'm gonna get it wrong more times than I get it right. But the goal is that over time, I will get closer and closer and closer to whatever my potential is. And everyone, audience, fellow creators, guest, yourself, friends, you are all a part of that journey. And if the heterodox community, if the creators on the internet that are guiding the conversations and the culture in as powerful of a way as we think that they are, if we want that to become as good as possible, then everybody needs to up that game. Everybody needs to hold themselves and everyone else to high standards, but they need to do it in a way that isn't just dunk fests. Like I don't think that that's, nobody has ever been lambasted or ridiculed into improvement. Like not in this sort of a format because you see the comments below or you see the replies on a tweet and you think, oh yeah, actually you are right, mate. Yeah, I was, uh, I'll, I'll listen to you egg 45 string of characters at symbol on, on Instagram. That's not, that's not gonna happen. Cool. So let's hold each other to account. <laughs> to be continued. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, 
develop your sovereignty and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>